Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Thunderstruck, our look back at the career of one Jushin Thunder Liger, as uh, told by each and every unique standalone guest and the matches that they pick to chronicle the uh, career and uh, like the legend of this great man. And uh, my name is W.H. Park. Of course, I am the host of the uh, Post Perez podcast here at postwrestling.com. And uh, today's uh, unique standalone guest is also a podcaster of, of uh, some renown. He is the host of the uh, Open the Voice Gate podcast, as well as the Everything Elite podcast, both of which you can find at VoicesOfWrestling.com. He is also the creator of this wonderful rating system called the Gentleman's Three. He is Iron Mike Spears. Mike, how are you today? I'm doing great, WH. Thanks for having me. Ah, thanks for uh, taking the time out to do this. And uh, before we get into the match that you picked, I, I want to talk about uh, your history as a wrestling fan in general. I want to talk about like how you got into Japanese wrestling and what does Jushin Liger mean to you? But but most importantly, first of all, I have to ask this question. What does the name Iron Mike come from? Is that an homage to either Canada's greatest athlete, Iron Mike Sharp, or the father of the million dollar man, Iron Mike DiBiase? So it kind of started as a absolute joke and bit because... I was in grad school, and with how what wrestling aired on over-the-air TV, I would download basically all the old ROH and Lucha Underground shows, and I would watch them as I was doing my laundry. And someone like made a joke about me ironing while doing this. I was like, that's kind of funny. I'm going to go with this and see how long this goes, because I would just tweet about going like, okay, Lucha Underground's on, time for me to get all my laundry done. And it was the former host of Music of the Mat, Chris Maffei was like, oh, now I'm, I'm just going to call you Iron Mike now. And it's kind of taken off from there to the extent that I have family members who like go, why do you, because they think it's about like Iron Mike Tyson. And I'm like, no, it just was a laundry joke that's kind of taken taken root. And I just uh, just become Iron Mike and I've just kind of gone with it since. I am uh, incredibly disappointed that it's not about Canada's greatest athlete, my Iron Mike Sharp. Uh, sorry to disappoint you there it's a lot less interesting it's a lot more lame of an answer than like someone out of boxing or iron mike sharp okay well it's still a good nickname and and tell us about before we get into your history as a wrestling fan tell us about the gentleman's three Uh, so this was a joke that i had with joe lanza that i pretty much was watching through things and like whenever you have your notebook out for the matches of the year or like four stars or better you come across a match that is just good and fine and you don't want to put much thought towards it so you just slap a three stars on you move on with your life you you don't put any more any more consternation you don't put any more thought into it you just say okay this is a gentleman's three and you just move on because if you spend too much time in the weeds of like your three stars and three and a quarter stars or two and three quarter stars matches then you don't have enough time to argue about matches that truly matter the journal three the gentleman's three is a match that you will forget about probably the next day but you but if, when you look back over your notes, it's like, oh, yeah, no, that match is fun, but nothing else. Yes. I, of course, I first learned about this via uh, Joe Lanza over at the uh, Voices of Wrestling uh, flagship podcast. And I, once I heard it, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Who? And then he talked about that you invented it. I was like, yeah, uh, Mike Spears, <laughs> a great, great man. Not only does he do, do a great uh, Dragon Gate podcast, but he, he created this amazing rating, uh, rating system. I don't know if it's a system. It's a, it's a particular rating that you can... Drop into like it's guess the the Meltzer five star rating system, I suppose, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's not a average match; it's a match that's pretty good, but it's also like a match that you're not going to care about next week. And when you go back over through the show and you say three stars on it, you're like, oh, I'm not going to go back and watch this because I don't have enough time. I'm like that with a lot of wrestling these days, Mike. I don't <laughs> know about you, but I'm, I'm definitely like that. But uh, let's talk about you as a wrestling fan. How did you become interested in the wild world of professional wrestling? Well, I feel like for a lot of people of my age and their early to mid 30s, you kind of grew up in a time where it was peak North American wrestling. So it was, I actually remember the exact first wrestling show I watched, WH, and I went back on Cage Match and looked it up and I was like, oh, this Matt, this TV show was completely garbage. How was this the thing that got me? to watching wrestling so it was the monday night raw right after breakdown 1998 okay what happened on that episode oh it was the fact that some cold steve austin was in trouble because he didn't count the pinfall right against a terrible title match between the undertaker and kane oh no 
It sounds oh, yeah, absolute garbage. Absolute garbage. But since then, like at that age, it was like the rise of the internet. And by that time, I'd started learning more and more about wrestling. I grew up in an area that did not have much of a local scene. So it was until college that I got to go see wrestling live that wasn't WWF or WCW. So it was one of the things that I was lucky to be growing up when I did with like a good America Online account and parents who didn't really care about what you searched on the internet for. And that's how I kind of, from there, it all took off. And now I am just, I. it's hard to think about my life without professional wrestling at this point because it's been a part of it for so long. Well, then like, let's dovetail into the world of Japanese professional wrestling. What was your exposure? What got you into that? So there were a couple of things that kind of were like tipping points into it. The first thing was, did you ever do much e-fetting growing up? Not really. It was just, it was just one of those things that I thought was really fascinating, but I just didn't have the, the patience for it. Like where you, you start e-fetting, like, like, what is it? EWR, right? It was one of the big ones. Okay. Mm. I get, make my roster. Okay. Then I'm going to hit the, going to set all these matches and hit the, the, you know, the, the, the play button, whatever, like c- commit to like the, the, the booking plans I made. And then you get all these results. And then I, I didn't have the patience. Like, no, I didn't want that to happen. This person left my company. Fuck. This guy didn't sign with my company. Shit. And so I was just like, no, I can't do this anymore. It's just going to drive me nuts. So I didn't really get into it. So the thing that got me was I would see all these other shows happening. And maybe I would have heard in passing or read in magazines these Japanese promotions. But then I started seeing these names pop up and I would try to hire them. And I was like, oh, why aren't they really working with like American wrestling? I was like, oh, OK, it's because that's they have their own kind of wrestling. It's the same thing with the luchadors in Mexico. And then from there, I just started searching it out. And really, it was about 2006 that I really got into Japanese wrestling. And that was, of course, because of Ring of Honor and Dragon Gate for that WrestleMania weekend. But it was one of the things that I was always kind of really kind of familiar with. And then at a certain point, especially like being in college and being able to see these things, I was just like, oh, I have an internet connection being on campus. And for the, like the first time... I could order a whole bunch of wrestling DVDs and not have my parents ask me why I ordered these DVDs from a weirdo in Pennsylvania. Let's go for it. And then from <laughs> from there, it just kind of snowballed to the to the point of other than All Elite, I don't watch very much North American wrestling whatsoever. It's almost everything is either from Japan or Mexico. Yeah, you know, like I uh, I I quickly got rid of the, uh, the the weirdo from Pennsylvania when I discovered uh, Jeff Lynch. And then, oh, there you go. Uh, and yeah. Then, uh, and then I discovered uh, Crazy Max Forums and, <laughs> you know, like, you know, we won't say anything more than that. But, yeah, that, that was those were my sources for, like, uh, getting uh, Japanese footage. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, could, I you know, I used the, the, the weirdo from Pennsylvania for a short time. And then it's like, nah, mm-hmm. eh, he's, he's a little unsavory. I'm not going to just, uh, you know, divest myself of, like, giving that person any more money. But anyways, we're not going to go too far into that anymore. But, like, so <laughs> you are... Of course, the host of the Open the Voice Gate podcast, which is a, a Dragon Gate centric podcast, and so like let's talk about that was your like, kind of guess your your gateway into the world of professional mm-hmm. wrestling. No pun intended. Was Dragon Gate, um, and so let's talk about Jushin Thunder Liger because this is a podcast about Jushin Liger. What was your I guess your your what does he mean to you, and like what was your you know kind of gateway to him? So I think it's impossible to tell the story of pro wrestling without talking about Jushin Thunder Liger. I think that he's someone for having such a long career that he's had, he, he the whole entire complexion of what it is to be a professional wrestler and what it is to be a junior heavyweight wrestler completely changed with Jushin Thunder Liger. So it, I'm someone that whenever like people talk about Hall of Fames and things of that nature for wrestling for sports, you're trying to tell the story of it. And I think you can't tell the story of pro wrestling right now without talking about how he had such a singular presence as a wrestler. And the first time I probably watched a Juice and Thunder Liger match might have been over at a friend's house when I was a kid. And his older brothers had old WCW tapes. So they would like put on like Pillman versus Liger and then all of his other appearances in North America. And then the older I got, the more I kind of seeked out his remaining career, the more I've realized like he might be one of the top 10 most important wrestlers of all time. 
And being able to see him live several times has been always something that is both like a treat of privilege because you're watching in a lot of ways. I know that it might be a little bit hyperbolic, but you're watching a wrestling god out there. Oh, so, I, I totally agree. I don't think it's hyperbole at all. Like, you know, of course, I'm doing an entire show on, on, <laughs> on a series on this man. So, like, I've been watching a lot of his output from, like, the early 90s, the mid-90s, the late 90s, the 2000s. Uh, and it's just like, my God, it just kind of reaffirms to me. And it kind of, like, I'm rediscovering my love for his wrestling matches, especially the stuff in the 90s, the stuff with, like, mm-hmm. Otani, Kanemoto, you know, Guerrero, Malenko, Benoit, and all those people that he just kind of made kind of this amazing promotion within a promotion, I, I sometimes say, about the New Japan Junior Heavyweight Division of the 90s. It is just amazing. Like, And we can't talk about him as only a wrestler. You have to talk about him as as a, as a booker as well because like, he just made so many stars and he had such an amazing eye for talent as well. Oh, absolutely. And when you like take that mid-90s New Japan Junior Heavyweight Division and you stack it up against most rosters throughout the history of wrestling and it might be one of the top five divisions of all time if not top three just because of how he was able to weave all these characters and wrestlers together that everyone felt special at the same time he portrayed them in a way and let them work to their strengths and it's just an incredible experience to go back and you know watch like black tiger 2 and watch like all these great wrestlers and it's one of those things that in a lot of ways you like look at this time period and look at these wrestlers and it would be foolish to say like the 2020s 2030s isn't cannot have potential to do something equally as great but when i look back at it i'm like oh this was might have been like the best time for a single wrestling division of all time and it's just incredible stuff that he was the guy spearheading all of this i for me like the only thing that matches it is like the the heavyweight division of all Japan for wrestling at that time of with like the four pillars, Misawa, Kawada, Kobashi, Tawe, and people like Akiyama, Stan Hansen, and the, you know, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, and Terry Gordy at the time. Like that's the only kind of like parallel I can draw is like as great as the junior heavyweight division of, of new Japan at the time. Not, and I don't even include like the heavyweight division of new Japan. Cause as good as that was, it wasn't as good as their junior division, as far as like the, the quality of matches. And as, the, the the number of like really interesting like you know personalities that existed within that company with that within that particular division of that company yeah and i i think one of the things that kind of took me aback about it is like when you think about like someone like d malenko who was in that division somewhat a little bit and then you have someone like chris jericho chris benoit eddie guerrero in there and you're just like oh at that time and a couple of years later these would have been four of the best wrestlers on the planet. And they just had them in this one division for a short period of time, but it was incredible stuff. It's, I don't even know like how they were able to look at that all together, but I look back at it and it's just insane. Well, let's get to the match you picked. We're going to look at a, a match from the 2000s and tell us which match you picked, Mike. So I went a little bit off the board, but I say true to myself, I picked the Super J Cup 2000 third stage final from April 9th, 2000, where Juice and Thunder Liger faced off against the young upstart and the budding superstar Shima in the finals of that tournament. Yes, and this is uh, emanating from uh, Ryugoku Kokugikan, aka Sumo Hall, and uh, this is this is a per- this was a, a J Cup promoted by Michinoku Pro Wrestling, and you would think like with Shima, in it, maybe I I originally thought, oh, this is going to be one of the this was promoted by Toriyaman, but it wasn't. It was promoted by M Pro. Yeah, and. Looking back and reading about the era and the time, this felt like Michinoku Pro's like trying to reclaim itself after five very hard years of nearly everyone leaving, but they had these Toriyaman guys in there for a couple of years before they launched Toriyaman Japan. And it, I just find this whole entire era of wrestling, like the late 90s, early 2000s, and the Japanese indies very fascinating. So that was an added thing for me to choose this match, was just how this kind of felt like an end of an era for Michinoku Pro. It, well, you know, a lot of people left Michinoku Pro, Delphin, mm-hmm. the, the Kaintai DX guys, but for the most part left. Uh, Great Sasuke has that effect on uh, people who work for him, you know? Oh, oh, sure, yeah. And it's interesting enough that we have that one of the guys that Liger faced off against this on this show was another guy who had a unique ability to get a lot of people angry at him. So it kind of fits that he was 
won the last start to Michinoku Kupro. Yes, it, it's not very, not that surprising, no. But so this is the uh, finals of the uh, Super J Cup, the uh, the third stage uh, from Sumo Hall. And uh, what can you tell us, like about the the like I guess the the tournament these two had leading up to their their meetup in the finals. So this was kind of a weird tournament, but in the same way you look back at it and it makes perfect sense that this would be the finals. Shima at this time, this might have been WH's 20th time he ever ever wrestled in Tokyo. Like he he was still very young in his career. He turned 22 the November before and he faced off against Ricky Marvin, who this was a couple of years before he was in Noah and was like one of like the the best parts of their junior division. But he faced against Ricky Marvin and Here's a name for you, Onryo. Yeah. Oh, I I haven't heard that name, and I I can't even know, can't even tell you how long it's been <laughs> since I heard his name. So yeah, Onryo. I think now he runs six six six. I believe so. Like I'm not into the uh, sleazy uh, Japanese indies, my friend, but uh, you know I'm sure uh, Mitchell, uh, like someone like Brother Mort, would be able to tell us all about six six six. So that that was his core final match, and then a name that now is in the news because he will be on the uh, January four and five shows. Naoki Sano was Shima's semifinal victory that he defeated. And then Liger face off against names that are pretty much when you talk about Lucha, when you talk about uh, Lucha Resu, he had, you have three of like some of the bigger names in its history. When you have, he went up against Tiger Mask four, Men's Tejo and Grand Hamada. So when you look at like the tournament and the brackets, you would not think Shima would get all the way there, but you would think that Liger would be the prohibitive favorite in the final. So it was very much like the young upstart, the Cinderella story, making his way to the finals against the living legend. Well, you got to think that maybe Ultimo Dragon had a lot of hand, you know, a lot, a lot of influence on the booking because like Shima would have been one of his guys that he would want to go really deep into the tournament, obviously all the way to the finals. It would either have been him or like someone like Magnum Tokyo, right? Yeah, and especially for this time, Shima and Magnum Tokyo, you mentioned, were the two big figures of the newly launched the Torimon Japan. Like this was just fourteen months after Torimon Japan became its own promotion. So this was very much like Ultimo in like his building mode before everything kind of went to hell between Ultimo and, and Shima. But he was pretty much the icon of the company and. When you looked at Shima, whenever they would have a Toriyamon offer match, it would always have Shima and one or two other members of Crazy Max on one side, and then Magnum Tokyo and two of the other wrestlers at the time. Usually it was Dragon Kid and maybe Misaki Mochizuki before M2K formed, but after that it would be him with M2K. So this was pretty much like the young star of Toriyamon making his way through it, and I think it was both Ultimo Dragon and Great Sasuke were the two big like figureheads for the show because later you would have Ultimo Dra- you have Great Sasuke face off against Shima at the first uh, Kobe World Kennen Hall show. Right. So th- this all kind of tied in together with how Toriyamon was at that time. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting thing to look at the like the early history of Toriyamon and how it like kind of evolves and then moves into like the the split with Ultimo and the most of the roster and then it, mm-hmm. you know the formation of Dragon Gate itself but let, let's get into the match itself so uh, as the video starts um uh, we see Shima he's seconded by his original unit the uh, the great Crazy Max and let's let's talk a bit about Crazy Max we have in his corner uh Don Fuji, uh, uh Suwa and uh, Taru and let me ask you this quick question about Taru Mike has he always been shit cuz he's as far as I've been watching him he's always been a shit wrestler Oh yeah he's garbage the, like like the most like the best role for Taru in wrestling has always been just like the second like the imposing looking second cuz he is by far, probably the worst wrestler of that area of Torbon, and he never got better, and he only got worse. I don't want any of these, like, you know, hipster pro-res nerds, like, who, like, think Zero One is the greatest promotion in 2019, like, twittering me and saying fucking shit like, <laughs> no, you don't understand, WH. Like, Taru is, like, sneaky good, and, like, you don't appreciate the sublimity. No, shut the fuck up. He sucks, okay? I have, I have an authority on Dragon Gate telling you that he fucking sucks, so don't 
if you're listening to this, rest assured, Taru has always been trash. Anyways, so we have that. But, you know, besides Shima, you got to say, Sua, that guy was a hell of a worker. Sua is the, out of, like, nearly any one of that era, he's the one that I wish his career didn't go down the way it did because he was just a unique force and presence in the ring because they used this thing used to go uh, that Sua was the crazy and crazy max. And he was just was ungodly at times. And he was someone who was in this tournament as well. So the Sasuke and Ultimo knew that these two guys were guys they wanted to feature because they made sure that they were involved in this tournament. And he was just incredible. And, for as much as I love Don Fuji, he was the second best, or maybe it's sometimes the best individual wrestler out of this unit. Oh, like Sua, you mean? Yes. Yeah, like so for me, Don Fuji is best as a tag wrestler. Like his team mm-hmm. with uh, Mochizuki, I could, I, I kind of liken that in a lot of ways to like the the team of Kawada and Tawei, with Fuji being the the Tawe figure and Mochizuki mm-hmm. is like the Kawada of of their tandem. Like that's one of my favorite Dragon Gate tag teams of all time. So I I'm a big fan of Don Fuji, but more as more as a tag wrestler, and especially his tag team with like Masaki Mochizuki was just like uh, ungodly good. It's one of the best tandems that ever existed in the history of Dragon Gate, in my opinion. And, and that's covering a lot of ground because you had so many great tag teams that existed in the history of that company. Yeah, and they were. The, the Seterans team was just someone that you knew that whatever bullshit that can be on the show, when they were Twin Gate champions, you'd be like, oh no, we're going to get a Mochi, a Mochi Fuji tag and this is going to rule. And the two of them just complement each other so well. So I'm totally with you. He was a lot better of a tag wrestler. And it's a weird thing like for like, new fans going back and seeing that that Don Fuji held the Open the Dream Gate title and actually faced off against Jushin Liger, weirdly enough. So, yeah, no, he was one of my favorite tag workers, but he's also someone that whenever I see on cards, I get a little happy. Like, Don Fuji, because I know he's just a cranky old man, and he's going to beat up people. I know what I'm going to get each time I see Don Fuji in 2019, and I appreciate that. There's a comfort in knowing what you're going to get with a certain performer, definitely. Mm-hmm. So we, we then see uh, Jushin Liger, and he is in... I gotta say, Mike, it's it's my favorite version of Jushin Liger, just the, aesthetically. The black Liger costume. This thing is gorgeous. Yeah, and it really kind of fit in like his character that he would portray in this match that he was wearing. He was a man in all black. His hair was still his natural hair, and he just looked like this like the living wrestling god that he is just out there against like the this young punk ass who was going to face him and he just looked like a badass and i loved it so much when i went back and watched this i was like oh wait he was wearing all black for this this rules yes yes it's such a great costume it's kind of thing like i love of course the classic red and white costume and and he would dabble in wearing like all white costumes and like you know blue costumes and things like that but for me it's like it's either the red or the white costume or it's this black costume. It's just so amazing. Like when I was getting tapes of this time of New Japan and I'd see him show up in other promotions like Dragon Gate and Toriyaman, I was like, yes, Black Liger. Got to get that. Got to get that tape because he's gone and I'm going to see that costume. It's like, it, it was so good that I, it, w- it would get me to like order like, you know, a $15, you know, DVD just because <laughs> I wanted to see him wrestle in that costume, Mike. And it always kind of felt like that he took on a different character when he was in when he was the man in black too. And I feel like this match was a great example of that as well because he just looked like a wrestling shadow. He looked like just like one of the most badass people alive, and of course he is. So seeing him on one side of the screen and then Shima in his classic black and white crazy max gear, and just you knew what you were going to get when you turned on the tape and you saw these two guys in the ring here. Definitely. So we we start the match up. There's a very loud crowd. Here in Sumo Hall, there's a big Shima call uh, right off the start. Uh, we we start off with the extended stare off between these two guys. The then we get into a collar and elbow lockup. There is an extended mat wrestling sequence that uh, you know sees Liger get the advantage with a hammerlock, and from that position, Liger drives his knees into Shima's arm. Then transitions into a camel clutch, uh, and Liger is really you know wrenching back on this move. But it's it's kind of interesting to see like these two guys who have kind of like this reputation of being like you know high flyers, like really going to the mat in early stages of this match. But not so much for Liger because like you know like if you've been watching him from the nineties, he has developed into this amazing mat wrestler, this amazing technical scientific wrestler, Mike. Yeah, no, Liger's uh, ground game, I think, is like the sneaky 
great part of his wrestling. And I loved how much he was just playing like the cranky veteran, the maestro to Shima and Shima being willing to go hold for hold. Something that you would never see Shima do in 2019 is wanting to do a whole bunch of ground grappling, but this was a lot of fun. And, you know, it's great to see cranky Liger, even in 2000, just, just give it to a young punk, especially with the uh, camel clutch. That was like one of the more brutal looking camel clutch that you'll see outside of a young lion match. Oh, definitely. Uh, from here, Liger attacks Shima's back. Uh, some more with forearm strikes to his back. Uh, Liger applies a ground abdominal stretch on Shima. Uh, Shima is able to transition uh, out of it into a, a, what is, a variation of the Romero special, one of Liger's signature moves, and into his own camel clutch on Liger. So he's he's trying to show, hey, I can keep up with this guy, this legend. I'm I'm the young upstart, but like, hey, you pay attention to me as well. Yeah, and a lot of it I feel like reflects like Shima's training and his mentors that we've talked about him in Ultimo Dragon, but he's also someone who was trained by Dos Karras. So he was willing to show that like, okay, you might be this wily veteran, but I'm able to like draw upon my training and do go hold for hold for you. And I feel like that in a match that he could have gotten eaten up, Shima was able to put on a pretty good display for himself in the ground grappling portion of it. Uh, Liger escapes the camel clutch and applies his, his signature Romero special uh, with the uh, dragon sleeper variation, a, a move I absolutely adore because like, it just looks like it hurts the hell out of his opponent. Yeah, he looked like a real asshole doing it, and I loved it. Like, it was incredible stuff. Uh, Liger moves into what looks like a kind of uh, rear naked choke on Shima. Uh, uh, Liger lets go of that move, and it just stops away on, uh, on Shima's back some more. So he's, like, really, like, I don't know. How, how would you say, like, his, his strategy is in this match? Just, like, just being a dick to Shima, basically, right? Yeah, I mean, he was being an utter asshole to him, just stomping on his back, treating him like a... Like the like he's like the asshole protege of Ultimo that he was. And you know, you look at like how Shima got into the finals, he had a really tough match against Naoki Sano, like just half hour before that, and he was able to like take this wrestler who had not gone this far into a show like wrestling three matches on show just throw him into the deep end and capitalize on it well speaking of the deep end Liger hits <laughs> Ashima with this Paul Orndorff like pile driver that looked absolutely oh. brutal just gross just this is just like it it was one of the more brutal pile drivers that I, I've seen that was not like on through a weapon or through a table because it was just like it was almost like a shoot pile driver. It was incredible stuff. Uh, he then goes for a sleeper hold on Shima, uh, which, yeah, he doesn't really, you know, win the match with this, obviously. Uh, Liger sh- uh, Shima shoots Liger into the ropes, and Liger hits uh, Shima with a huge shoulder block. He follows up with uh, chops. Uh, Shima is able to catch Liger with a head scissors and drives him into the turnbuckles. Uh, what a, I guess one of his early signature moves. I don't really see him do it that often now. Yeah, uh, Shima is someone who now his offense is completely different. And, you know, he was someone that for like the time period, he was quite the flyer and quite the just like the head scissors maven. And before his knees gave out, it was like a really cool thing to see him do a move that now has come so commonplace. Shima was doing this 20 years ago where you wouldn't see someone doing head scissors into the turnbuckle. It was just kind of like a fun reminder of the kind of wrestler that Shima was and what he's evolved into. Yeah, he catches Liger with a super kick, follows up with a basement drop kick that sends Liger to the floor. Uh, Shima follows up with one of my favorite moves of his early career, the, the kind of as a twisting planche dive. So he, he catapults himself over the top rope and he starts twisting in midair and just hits his opponent who's on the floor. This is a beautiful move, Mike. Yeah, and it, it's one of those things that... I don't think Shima, for, for wrestlers who are, or people who are just watching Shima now, I don't think they realize like how innovative of a flyer he was doing this like corkscrew tornado like dive where the amount of body control and like weight control that Shima had and showed in this was incredible stuff. Like the basement drop kick into it. He just, I, it's one of those things I don't think people realize like how fast of a wrestler Shima used to be and what all he would just flow into. Cause like that was the one thing is that he would flow his moves one to another. You went thrust kick, basement drop kick, torneo, the palm strike, the iconoclasm, mad splash. Like it was just incredible stuff to see it. And you know, for in a scenario where Liger could have just done the Liger match and make Shima look like crap, he let Shima do all these great high spots, whereas he was more focused on being 
the veteran. I think that shows how much of a selfless wrestler Jushin Thunder Liger is. Oh, I mean, that's kind of like part of like his story, isn't it? Like how selfless mm-hmm. he is, like how many people he has put over in his career without any kind of ego. And like, because I think, you know, he is one of those wrestlers of his level, of his stature that understands the importance of building other people up you know, in, in, in your company or in other companies so that when you have a match with them, you're going to make more money. I th- he is, he's one of the smartest people to ever put on the boots and act as a booker. And, you know, like when he's not the booker anymore, he's still doing things like that are selfless. It's incredible, really, if you think about it. Oh, it, it's absolutely phenomenal because this is a match that where Shima was as a wrestler coming out of it, this would have been one of the big things where he would finally got a big spreads on him in shoe pro where he would get like the coverage of him here. And, and Liger knew that's like, oh, if I make this guy here, then later he's going to become a superstar, which Shima was and still is to this day. And Liger knew like, if I don't eat this guy up, if I don't just like squash him like the four-year-old, I mean, he, Shima's only four years in his career here. He could have just done whatever he wanted and there's nothing Shima could do, but it just shows like how brilliant of a mind Jushin Thunder Liger did that he made sure that this guy looked like a million bucks. Uh, from here, Shima catches Liger with chops and slaps to the head. There's a double knees to the corner. Uh, Liger is, comes back. He hits a shote on a charging Shima. Uh, Shima recovers and hits his own palm strike to Liger's face. So we're kind of getting to this phase where there's a lot of back and forth between these guys. Yeah, and with like Shima, his palm strike never was like the big, just like hot move that the shote was, but it always was a move in his an arsenal that always led to something and having like a palm strike versus palm strike part, I thought was really kind of a cool thing to see because you really wouldn't think that these two guys would be the guys that would have like the battle of the palm strikes. But when they start having it, you're going like, Oh no, totally. This makes perfect sense. From here, uh, Shima puts Liger on the top rope and he hits his kind of upper, the uprising uppercut palm strike. What is, what is that move called? I completely blanked out Mike. That one in that uh, scenario is called the Venus. The Venus. And then he goes from there to the Iconoclasm Slam. And then uh, same sequence. He does the same sequence, except this time uh, Shima crosses the arms on the Iconoclasm. And everyone knows, Mike, you know, I know, everyone knows that crossing the arms makes the move 1,000 times more effective. 1,000 times more effective because you're getting their shoulder blades out and it makes them look like a kind of an idiot letting their arms get crossed. It's hundred times more effective. No, a thousand times more effective. Oh, come on. Bad. A thousand times. Yes. I've been in this game a little bit longer as watching this stuff. So it's a thousand times. <laughs> I, I'll forgive the mistake just this one time, Mike. But uh, from here, Thank we, we see you. we see Shima going for his signature mat splash, but it's, it's blocked by Liger getting his legs up and uh, hitting Shima, not with his knees, but with his feet. And this looked really painful. <sighs> it just was a brutal looking move. And it was another example of Liger just being like the veteran asshole in this match that he could have just like done it with his knees but nope he's gonna have his feet into Shima's gut and face yep uh from here Liger continues being an asshole he stomps a mud hole into Shima in the corner he's just assaulting this poor young man he's like he's like essentially mugging him in this match Mike yeah it was it's one of the things that for someone with a little bit of reputation of eating up younger wrestlers like shima is nowadays that he got he got dose of his own medicine and they, these were really gnarly looking boots and that he was putting to him i loved it uh liger pushes the ref aside he then uh starts slapping the shit out of shima it's like jesus he what did he do what did shima do did he did he stiff him on like lunch or something earlier in the day i don't know I, and i think it was this point that shima started bleeding from his mouth I, I don't know if it was here or before, but he started getting a pretty, like, bad, like, it wasn't, like, a straight-up cut, but his mouth started to swell up and he started bleeding. So, I, he, you have to pay for your veteran's lunch. You have to make sure that they have whatever drinks they need in the back, and Shima learned his lesson by not obeying the hidden rules of wrestling here. He didn't get Liger the proper onigiri from the convenience store. He got him the, That's it. the tuna mayo instead of the uh, the seaweed. It's a big mistake. It's uh, don't do that. Anyways, uh, from here, from this assault, Mike uh, Liger hits the Liger bomb on Shima. But guess what? Shima kicks out at fucking one. Incredible. He just uh, because the, that's where the match would have ended normally, right? It would have been Liger bomb, and that would have done it. But Shima just is enough of a little prick to say I'm not going to go down to that. Okay, Liger then hits the brainbuster. 
One, two, he kicks out. Jesus. Liger's throwing everything at this dude. Yeah, and for, for Shima, this was kind of the match, other than like when he faced off a little bit against Sasuke and Takamichinoku, that he just was like, I am not letting this old asshole put me down like the rookie I am. And I thought that this was something that for a sumo hall crowd that was really loud to start and kept on building, building the crowd really got into like the kick out at one, the kick out at two from the brain buster. It was really kind of cool stuff seeing the uh, sumo hall crowd get behind Shima here. Oh yeah. I think it's obviously this is really deliberate on Liger's part to like get Shima over that. He's going to get kicked. He's going to kick out of like two of his signature finishers in the Liger bomb and, and the and the brain buster and like you can definitely hear it like I I made a note it's like yeah there's a huge support for Shima from this crowd you can hear these like people chanting his name and and yelling out his name to support him and stuff just absolutely brilliant on Liger's part the guy who knows how to get people over I see I've seen him do it with like Otani I've seen him do it with like like Great Sasuke I've seen him do it with like El Samurai and now he's doing it here for for Shima Mike yeah and I think this is kind of like a good time to mention. One of Shima and Toriyama's big pull there was, and it's kind of familiar to how Bushiroad now markets their wrestlers, was they went heavily after the teenage girls. And you could always tell that you had a Shima crowd in there because the chance would be a little bit more higher pitched. It would be a lot more fervent. You'd get a lot more just random calls for Shima. And it was just great idea from Liger going like, oh, his younger teenage fans, I'm going to make sure that they have absolute doubt that their like their teen bop hero is going down here and it's just another thing that Liger knowing what to do at the right time it yeah, what a genius absolute fucking genius this man uh, uh shima blocks another shote attempt from Liger. he ducks another one following that and then it, it's just it's 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 on mike with between these two at this point of the match right yeah this is where the, the match kicked into its final gear especially like kicking out after the first brain buster and the two of them basically just hauling off and especially for shima this was a big moment where it wasn't just him trying to survive in the first half of the match this is like shima going like okay you can kind of see the gears moving his head and thinking all right i duck this and i think i can beat this guy i think i can take care of this guy because he hasn't had the mad splash it yet i still have that card in my pocket and i know that as long as i don't get another shote and i don't get brain bustered again i can stay in this thing so then we see this kind of weird, I have my notes, a weird kind of Dragon Sleeper Russian leg sweep combo. Yeah, and maybe it is me watching this match nearly 20 years later, but when I watched this, I was like, okay, is he going to go for the perfect driver? Or is this like a, a setup for this? Because Shima's known now for having just the most ridiculous, like over, like exorbitant move set. And he even has that mind here where he takes a dragon sleeper and then he just sweeps his legs out and does a somewhat Russian leg sleep or a reverse DT of it. It was crazy stuff. It was, re- it was really interesting to watch. And I'm just like, I-, I don't think I've ever seen that move done since. If it exists like in other matches, I can't remember it. But I just was I, I made a note of it. I was just like really impressed with it. From from here, Shima uh, goes to the top and he hits his signature mat splash for a one, a two. Holy shit, Liger kicks out, Mike? Yeah, this was kind of the thing where when you, if you watch this and totally unspoiled, you'd be like, okay, this is it. The young guy beats the veteran because at this time, Liger had already won a Super J Cup in 95. So you're like, okay, this is it. Now this is going to be like the, the passing of the torch here. Nope, not yet. There's still more to this match. Well, you know, the, one of the other notes I made is like, so from this mass splash that only gets a two count, it looks like it does look like like Shima rolls off of him before the three mm-hmm. count. Like and it just kind of perplexed me. Like the idea was, I suppose that Liger is supposed to kick out, but but it doesn't look like he kicks out necessarily. But it looks like Shima just decides, oh, this is not the finish. I got to get off of him. Yeah, I, I think this might be him deferring to the veteran and making sure that no matter what, that this would be a two count. You know, I, I feel like that that was what happened here. Uh, yeah, if if that's the case, it looked little bit sloppy but i'm I'm not going to deduct any any points for for the effort though uh shima hits liger in the bread basket with a drop kick and follows up with some hard slaps but uh liger uh hits a shote as uh, shima comes off the ropes that liger then hits a series of devastating brain busters for the one two and three 
And so uh, Liger defeats uh, Shima at in 12 minutes and 28 seconds. And uh, yeah, final thoughts in this match. I really liked it. Yeah, like for Shima, who I think his career will go down, that he was more, much better as a tag wrestler. I felt like that at this time of his career, I thought this was a blast of a match. And I feel like that this told a really great story between the two of them. And, you know, I say that the, the match time, 12 minutes, 28 seconds, it both doesn't feel as short as as that time and it doesn't feel overly long as well which i would consider like a hallmark of a veteran like you know great worker like liger who's just able to pace things perfectly and lay out a match that you know you you, you think wow i watched something kind of epic you know but it and you, when you think of epic matches you think that they're long but then wow wait it was, it was under 15 minutes holy shit <laughs> and on top of that I don't know what you would take out of this match. I don't know what you should add into this match. For like a 12-minute match, this took you through all the beats it needed to, and I feel like it told a, a incredible story there. So I don't even know, WH, if, what I would add into it to make this match even longer. I feel like that 12 minutes is the perfect time for it. Oh, I totally agree with you. I'm, I, I have this idea that, you know, like, you can, like, add another five minutes to a certain match or take away five minutes from another match, or ten minutes from another match. But those matches that you don't feel like, oh wait, it's oh it's over. But you don't feel like you you're cheated out of something, or you if a match goes really long, but you don't feel it went really long because you you were just along for the whole ride. That's a perfect match. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't. I, mean, I feel like that that's how this match was. I wouldn't say it's near. I'd say it's near perfect. I wouldn't say it's completely perfect for for my taste but i enjoyed the hell out of it i'm I'm really happy you picked it i i think it's an excellent example of this aspect of liger that you and i were talking about earlier like his selflessness like how unselfish he is how much he understands the business and how much he looks at the the next generation that came that came after him and thought i gotta make these people stars Absolutely. And if you look at the path of Shima and of Torimon into Dragon Gate after that, Liger was completely right. It, this was kind of a match that, in a wrestling scene that we talked a little bit about how Michinoku Pro was, it wasn't on Death's Door and it still exists today, but this was one of the last major times that it was relevant. This was a big moment to choose, okay, we have the 90s were all about Ultimo Dragon, they were all about Liger, of course, they're about great Sasuke and all these great juniors in the New Japan division, the New Japan Junior Heavyweight division. This showed that maybe it's not the same thing, and it, of course isn't, but Torimon in a lot of ways became like the heirs of both the New Japan division of that time and Michinoku Pro. So it made perfect sense, like historically looking back at it, Liger was absolutely right. And this was Ashima's like first big move towards the national stage after outside of Torimon and Michinoku Pro, Liger made this guy look like amazing. And ever since then, it just proved how right Liger was. Of course, you know, Shima would go on to become like a legendary figure in, in both Toriyama and Japan. And then of course, later as one of the founders of Dragon Gate and, uh, you know, his, his original unit was Crazy Max. But I got to tell you, Mike, my, my Besides Crazy Max, probably my favorite unit that, that Shima was ever in was the original incarnation of Blood Generation. Oh, just an incredible time. Like, Crazy Max, because Sua leaves, and Taro being the shithead Taro is, left Dragon Gate, he, com- he, he nearly completely reinvented himself from the, um, the early 20s Shima and Crazy Max to like, being this leader that he was able to get guys like Naruki Doi, Masato Yoshino into blood generation of course he had his best friend don fuji along for the ride and it was such a fun time in dragon gate with blood generation oh and of course uh, his protege shinko takagi was in that group as well just an amazing group and they i gotta say the original blood generation has probably my favorite dragon gate theme song oh god it's incredible stuff like it, it's one of those themes that i have the I, I managed to order i think it was from amazon dot co dot jp they had the all the unit theme songs up until 2013 it was the 15th anniversary thing and the blood generation theme is one of the best ones they ever had it's an incredible song oh it's i every time i heard that i was just like pump my fist in the air oh yeah blood generation is coming out oh fucking doi yoshino and shiva they're gonna just kick somebody's ass like unfortunately 
you know, then they included some other people into the into the unit, and it kind of diluted it like fucking magnitude Kishwada. I don't care what anyone says. I'm, if he's a, if you're if you're one of his fans, Mike, I apologize. I thought he sucked. You know, not oh big, no, uh, he was not great. <laughs> you know, big boss magma magnitude Kishwada, whatever, whatever name he was using at the time, and then Gamma fucking joins, and it's like it just Dragon Gate just takes a a big dive for me when when ever Gamma is involved in, in Dragon Gate stuff. I don't know how you feel about Gamma. I'm just not a fan of that dude. Well, I mean, the the bigger problem was Gamma came along and then they made this huge feud of who's going to lead uh, blood generation between Gamma and Shima, which part of it was just all about Gamma wanting to kick Shima in the balls nonstop. And it's just one of those things that Gamma just really sleazed it up. Of course, they both jumped over from Asaka Pro, which is, you know, another one of these junior promotions that kind of fed into each other. And they would be the next host of a Super J Cup. But when it, when those two kind of became like the big stars, and I feel like that was because they didn't feel like that Shingo, Doi, Yoshino, then later BB Hulk and Yamato were ready. It just was a very kind of weird part because they were fine in like a Triangle Gate team. But having like one of the King of Gates, I forget which one, I think it was 2006, be all about how Gamma kicked Shima so hard in the crotch that he could no longer wrestle was just ridiculous and too sleazy for me. I couldn't stand it. Well, I don't remember that. Thank God. I, I, I maybe <laughs> scrubbed that from my memory, Mike. So we, we shall not talk about that era of Dragon Gate uh, any further. But, uh, you know, I, l- let's wrap it up here. And I, I want to say, Mike, thank you so much for, for coming on to uh, Thunderstruck. This is a great episode. I, I got to say, this is probably one of my uh, one of my top four episodes that I've recorded so far. I thought you just added so much uh information and, and knowledge to to the career of Jason Liger via your knowledge of Dragon Gate. Well, I had an absolute blast, WH. It's been an honor and a privilege to do this with you. I just, when, when, like, thinking about Jushin Liger, I know that a lot of people are going to go immediately towards his New Japan stuff, and rightfully so, but I thought it was important for us to talk about how he touched other parts of the pro rest community. Oh, definitely. So for those uh, listeners who want to find out uh, more about uh, Iron Mike Spears, where can people find you? So I'm on Twitter at Fuji Heya. That is with two eyes, like Don Fuji. I host and co-host two podcasts for voices of wrestling. The first one is open the voice gate, which is a monthly look into dragon gate and the dragon system. That is me alongside case low and then as well, the other side of the Dragon System that incidentally is with All Elite, I co-host a pod- a weekly podcast called Everything Elite There. If you follow me on Twitter, I have links to all this. And we just launched a Everything Elite Patreon where we get to just kind of explore other topics in wrestling that we find interesting. And one of the topics I've been doing is looking at Shima after Dragon Gate looking at OWE and Strong Hearts, and that's been one of my favorite things to do. So if you go to my Twitter, I have links to all of this. And then again, that's at Fuji Heya. Thank you so much, WH. I had such a blast doing this with you. Oh, yeah, definitely follow uh, Mike on Twitter. I do. It's it's. If I want to know something about Dragon Gate, I, I will definitely just go to Mike's Twitter handle. It's like, okay, what did he say? What happened to this unit here? I, I'm sure Mike knows, or I'll listen to Open the Voice Gate, a great podcast. So those of you who, who are Dragon Gate fans, but you, you don't necessarily know what podcast to listen to, definitely listen to Open the Voice Gate over at VoicesOfWrestling.com. Mike, Mike and Case Low have like, the, the all the information that you need, especially with the, the demise of uh, uh, iHeartDG, since that went away. Like I gotta say, you you and Case are like the the premier resources for English speaking Dragon Gate fans in the world. Thank you so much. That is too kind. The, the thing that gets me is Case is twenty or twenty one, and he's already this good of a source and like writer. And I'm just thinking, oh god, in three or four years, Case Lowe's gonna get all of us out of all of our podcasts, all our reviews because case as a resource and as a writer and as a podcaster is one of my favorite people to record with but i had an absolute blast recording with you wh uh, this was so much fun thank you mike i i hope we can do something in the future like the uh the this idea i have that i'm not going to talk about now i'll tell i'll tell you about it off air but i, <laughs> I got an idea for a, 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 something to do for post wrestling in 2020 that that maybe you can come on to that as well but we'll we'll save that for you know the the, the future so uh for all the listeners, uh, thank you for tuning in, and I appreciate uh, the, the wonderful feedback I've been getting on for Thunderstruck. And until the next episode, I will say to everyone, goodbye. <laughs>